Hi, everyone. Um, happy Saturday. Happy Sunday. I hope everyone's weekend is great so far. Oh, what a what a weekend, right? There's there are news about war <laughs> everywhere. So I'm going to talk about um, CCP's plan, or at least what, what they have in mind about Taiwan in a little bit. But let's. Um, I have I have given you the outline um, in the description. It's pretty straightforward. An insider. Um, who is connected to the CCP leadership has revealed some of the information that we've always been wondering. And I think it connected a lot of dots. So we'll first talk about why the CCP has postponed its third you know, plenary session. Uh, we'll, then we'll talk about uh, how the Chinese leader plans to handle his political and economic uh, crisis right, in, in, in China. And then his relationship with the Princeton opposition forces. Last but not least, his plan for Taiwan. So these are pretty straightforward topics, and we'll cover them all. Um, so we know the third plenary session of CCP, CCP's 20th Party Congress um, hasn't happened yet. Uh, but traditionally, the third plenary session takes place in the fall of the year following the party congress. And the session focuses on economic and, and reform policies. So the fact that it's been six, uh, six months, uh, it's been delayed for six months, um, has got a lot of people speculating. Um, regardless what the reasons are, the fact that this this important session hasn't been taken place indicates that Xi Jinping is experiencing a political crisis within the party. Some believe that the severe economic downturn in China has made it difficult to set a agenda for the meeting. Others believe that the continuous downfall of senior officials has posed a dilemma in personnel arrangements. Um, a uh, a writer. A journalist working for Nikkei Asia, his name is Kanji uh, Nakazawa, he gave the reason that Xi Jinping cannot let his weaknesses be exposed and that he will convene the session only when he can demonstrate political strength. Then there's also the speculation that Xi Jinping wants to establish his wife, singer Peng Yuan, politically by nominating her to a key position at the third plenum and therefore is waiting for the right time to do so. All of the above explanations seem to offer some valid points, but somehow I'm not totally convinced that they are the determining, determining factor. Lately, one China expert obtained information from a CCP insider, and what he disclosed seems to have tied many loose ends together, at least for me. So um, let me share this with you. So Chinese dissident and uh, law professor Yuan Hongbing, who, uh, who I have presented many times, he, he lives in Australia. He recently gave a full explanation of why Xi Jinping hasn't held the third plenum based on information he obtained from his sources. And the information is very detailed, and it also explains why Xi Jinping favors Cai Qi over the premier Li Qiang um, and some of other officials. It explains how he plans to navigate through the internal political and economic storms and his relationship with the princeling opposition forces and his plan for Taiwan. So all of that seem, you know, seems to tie together. So let's go over, let's get to them one by one. So according to Professor Yuan, after securing uh, another term at the party's 20th Congress, Xi Jinping originally wanted to use the third plenum to completely um, uh, repudi, sorry, uh, completely deny or reject the late CCP leader Jen Zemin's legacy and policies. He planned to blame all governance and societal crisis, um, as well as the economic decline, on Jiang, on Jiang Zemin, 
and introduce and then introduce his own reform and opening up policy, one that embraces Maoist ideas. But due to the troubles with his own appointed officials, notably the former Foreign Minister Qin Gang and the Defense Minister Li Shangfu, she is forced to delay his plan as he suddenly faced the challenge of lacking credibility to launch a political campaign against Jiang um, as Xi's own officials are caught uh, in corruption. So this has led to the postponement of the third plenum. Um, and the person who came up with this grand plan is no other than Xi Jinping's right-hand man, Politburo Standing Committee member. Do I have a picture? Yeah. Uh, Cai Qi. Uh, here, are the, here are the seven members. Cai ranked number five. If you if you see the this line of <laughs> the seven men, how they rank, uh, he rank, officially ranks number five. Uh, but he's really the second uh, most powerful person after Xi Jinping. He controls the most powerful institution within the CCP leadership, the Central Secretariat. So according to uh, Professor Yuan's source, about a year ago, Cai Qi and several um, secretaries from the Central Secretariat, now, and including the head of the United Front Work Department, Shi Taifeng, the propaganda department head, uh, Li Shulei, and the public security minister, Wang Xiaohong, um, they collectively presented a plan to Xi Jinping. And they suggested to Xi that in order to address and reduce the prevailing public dissatisfaction or resentment towards the Communist Party's rule, Xi should start a new party line campaign or struggle at the third plenum. And the new campaign um, will hold former CCP leader Jiang Zemin accountable for the rampant corruption, economic downturn, and other political and societal crisis, and make it clear to people that these problems are the consequences of Jiang's bad policies. It was said that Xi Jinping loved the idea proposed by Cai Qi and the others. Ever since Xi Jinping became the CCP's crown prince more than a decade ago, he has been embroiled with a, in, in a life and death struggle with the Jiang faction behind the scene. I've made many videos on the subject. Now, Jiang Zemin is dead, but, uh, but during, his, during his time in power, he was notoriously responsible for two things. One is the moral decline in Chinese society, which resulted in systemic corruption. And two, the persecution of Falun Gong. That's like his, you know, two, two, uh, two things that Jiang Zemin is most famously responsible for. However, after Jen, uh, after she, because he's really not responsible for the economic reforms because Deng Xiaoping was, right? And and so so Jen Zemin basically just you know took over the helm from, from Deng Xiaoping. And then the 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 uh, the mastermind behind the economic reforms were his um premier, Zhu Rongji. So Jen did nothing, you know, he's not a visionary, he's not a uh, he's not someone with a mind uh, of economic reforms. So, so all the other accomplishments were not his. Um, but he was held, most people would agree that he, he is responsible for those two things, system, systemic corruption and then the persecution of Falun Gong. So after Xi Jinping came to power, um, he has been struggling uh, for the past 10 years, you know, trying to, you know, see if he should deny Jen's policies, but he hasn't. So corruption and the persecution of Falun Gong continued to this day. And after Jen's death under pressure, Xi Jinping even made, you know, a speech full of high praises for Jen Zemin. So some people say if Xi Jinping had done it when he first came to power, 
he would have been successful because when Xi Jinping first came to power, he did have the support of a lot of the the people and the official, and the officials. But after ten years or eleven, twelve years now, you know, people don't see him any better than his predecessors. So. So it's a bit too late for him to reject Jen now, as as he is equally guilty. But anyways, that was the idea proposed to him to help him navigate the political and economic storms, and he liked it. However, after the um, you know uh, in the past year, a series of high-ranking officials, uh, including the commander of the rocket force, the, mini the two ministers of defense, of national defense and of foreign um, affairs, were taken down, and these people had been handpicked by Xi Jinping himself. Uh, but now, all of a sudden, these people are involved in significant corruption, and they um, may even not be. They may not even be loyal to Xi Jinping. And the subsequent investigations as a result of the downfall of these people or these individuals has implicated nearly 200 generals and officials. And the list continues to grow. So under such circumstances, if Xi Jinping tries to pin the blame for corruption solely on Jen Zemin, it wouldn't be very convincing to people. It will back. It will cause backfire. Therefore, Xi Jinping has temporarily shelved this plan, and hold off the third plenum. Um, but people believe that Xi Jinping will not completely abandon the idea. Um, Actually, here's a picture of Tai Chi, the, the man who came up with this idea um, that made Xi Jinping, you know, Xi, that, that Xi Jinping liked. Um, so therefore, he has temporarily shelved the plan. But people believe that he will, after he has um, taken care of the, the, after he has, you know, finished the clean, house cleaning, he will... Um, he is very likely to um, to adopt that idea uh, because only by criticizing and attacking Jen Zemin can he find a way out of his current predicament and and be enshrined as uh, a leader on par with Deng Xiaoping and Mao Zedong. Uh, Professor Yuan Hongbin also revealed that she originally planned to criticize Deng Xiaoping along with Jen Zemin as Deng's policies contra contradicted uh, Mao's, but he realized that his current political power is insufficient to openly challenge Deng Xiaoping's stature. Thus, he temporarily excluded Deng uh, from his targets and focused only on Jiang Zemin. And his strategy is, um, you know, just divide his opponents, because right now people, you know, whether it's from the Jan faction, the Deng faction, the Prince Lin faction, you know, people are all organizing to oppose him. So rather than, you know, attacking uh, many people, he, he wants to conquer and divide. He wants to divide his enemies and, and target on uh, target on a smaller target. Um, so, so that, that's what Professor Yuan's um, source has revealed. Now, let, now let's talk about the princelings. Uh, Xi Jinping obtained the support of the children of top CCP leaders, aka the Red Princelings, when he first came to power. But over the years, his relations with them have deteriorated so badly that some have openly opposed him. And the most outspoken one is former Air Force General Liu Yazhou, who is the son-in-law? Do I have a picture of him? I here we go. Who is the son-in-law of the of, uh, of one of the former Chinese president Li Xianyan? General Liu was recently given a life sentence um, on charges of corruption, but we know the real reason for his heavy sentencing is not is not just corruption. Um, so, according to uh, Professor Yuan's source. Before this year's two sessions, which was which was held what in the beginning of March, yes, first week of March, Xi Jinping sent a deputy secretary uh, from the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection 
to speak with key members of the princelings, including Liu Shaoqi's eldest son, General Liu Yuan, and Deng Xiaoping's eldest son, Deng Pufang. I think I have pictures of them. Here's Liu Yuan, General Liu Yuan, and here's Deng Xiaoping's eldest son, Deng Pufang. These two are the two foremost princeling heavyweights. I have made a video on that. You can check them out. I think it was from a month ago, maybe February. No, it was, I made the video February or January. Time flies. I can't imagine. It's already April. My memory is still <laughs> somewhere uh, January and December. Anyways, um, I think it was January I made the video. Yeah, you can check them out about the princeling. And um, now the the official who was sent to meet with these princeling heavyweights uh, informed them about General Liu Yazhou's sentencing and said his charges were, quote, being anti-CCP or anti-party and undermining the PLA. So that's his crime. He was anti-CCP or his activities were anti-CCP or anti the party and undermining the military. That was his, that was his crime. Specifically, it referred to Liu Yazhou's open critis criticism of Xi Jinping's strategic direction regarding Taiwan and his spreading his opinions widely that a war with the U.S. over Taiwan would be doomed to fail. Uh, now, General Liu is a military strategist and a prolific writer who has a large following among the PLA officers. So Xi Jinping sees Liu's spreading his ideas as, you know, quote, killing the morale of um, his military servicemen. So the official um, who, who Xi Jinping sent to, to meet with the um, princelings warned the princelings not to organize any activities against Xi, nor conspire to pose challenges to his leadership. Uh, now, General Liu Yuan and Deng Pufang are two of the are, are, are two of the I should say two are the two most powerful princelings who are capable of challenging Xi Jinping's authority. Um, now, according to the person who released this information, the princelings represented by Liu and Deng want to return, um, or, or the princelings spearheaded by General Liu and Deng Pufang, want to return to Deng Xiaoping's reform and opening up days and implement a collective leadership. They do not want to uh, Xi Jinping's personal dictatorship. They want to go back to a time when they, um, like Deng Xiaoping had a, uh, although Deng Xiaoping was the head, was the leader, but he shared power with eight other um, senior leaders of CCP, right? He had to consult with them um, and, you know, create consensus among them. But those people pretty much just kind of, you know, you know, really don't bother um, to challenge his, really don't, didn't challenge his decisions unless it's a major issue, like June 4th, uh, Tiananmen Square um, student movement. So they wanted they want to go back to that time, that kind of leadership. It's called a collective leadership. Um, and they also want to return to Deng Xiaoping's policy of uh, what's that saying? Tao Guang Yinghui, stay low and bide our time and avoid confrontation with the United States. Um, and they believe, these people believe that if Xi Jinping continues on his current path, their family's um, political and economic privilege would, uh, would be hurt and the regime will suffer major crisis and may even fall. So faced with this situation, um, Xi Jinping has both threatened and warned them by harshly sentencing Liu Yazhou um, and also briefing them uh, before the two sessions. Um, so I think he's he's warning them, but he's also opening, you know, has a has a 
has a channel of communication open, um, similar to what Joe Biden is doing, <laughs> right? You have to keep the co communication going, and then you do what you need to do to punish them. Anyways, <laughs> so um, Professor Yuan's uh, his analysis of, of, of this information is that he thinks the real crisis for the, for the CCP is Xi Jinping's intention to attack Taiwan. Uh, because according to the information he received from his source within, within, uh, within Beijing, Xi Jinping claimed in a Politburo Standing Committee me meeting that CCP had weathered the three-year famine of the 1960s and that the current situation is not anywhere as severe. Therefore, Xi Jinping called for countering domestic and international pessimism about the Chinese economy and to sing high praises of China's economic prospect. So he, you know, his argument was, look, if we survived the three-year famine back then, we're, you know, we should be able to survive the current economic situation. I mean, we are in, in much, much, much better situation than we were in the 1960s. But he forgot people are different. You know, the people that he's dealing with now um, are very different from the Chinese people back in the 1960s. So, but anyways, so Yuan's sources reveal that during the conversation with the princelings, the deputy secretary, the official CCP, I mean, the official uh, Xi Jinping sent, reiterated that Xi Jinping's priority right now is the Taiwan issue and not economic recovery. Okay, so, so, so his priority is the Taiwan issue and not economic recovery. And the official emphasized um, and, and, and said something like, um, Uh, he said something that I think should serve as a warning to us all, um, because you know everyone is concerned with World War III uh, being not too far away from us, right? Given what's happening in in the Middle East now, um, I think what the official told the princelings can confirm our our worry about a war a world war world war three. <laughs> okay, so he told the princelings. Okay, this is what the official sent by Xi Jinping told the princelings at the meeting. He said, the international situation has brought the CCP to a period in which great threats and great opportunities both present themselves or both coexist. All right, so, so this is what they think. They say in the current international situation has brought, has given, has provided the regime, uh, the CCP, a period in which great threats and great opportunities coexist or both, both present themselves. And the party leadership has already smelled the, the scent of gunpowder from war. <laughs> so they have already smelled war approaching. Therefore, Xi Jinping has demanded the princelings to keep, quote, keep the big picture in mind and not engage in any unwelcomed activities that could be detrimental to, to Xi's leadership. Okay, so this is very clear. You know, I mean, CCP sees the current geopolitical position as both, you know, a good opportunity and also threatening. So the question is, you know, how would it, how would they react to that? What, how would they utilize the opportunities? Um, so Professor Yuan believes that Xi Jinping's window for launching a war in the Taiwan Strait is set between 2025 and 2027, uh, because the CCP thinks that after the 2024 U.S. election, America will face worse societal and political divisions than after the 2020 election. And this will significantly weaken uh, the country's will and, ca and capability to intervene in a Taiwan conflict. This is, this is the calculation going through the minds of this 
CCP uh, leader, leaders. Um, so, I mean, 2027 has been a year given, right, for for the it's the approximate time. I mean, we've heard this from a U.S. general. I mean, we've heard about 2027 is the year that the CCP has ordered the PLA to be ready for war. And yesterday, the Wall Street Journal, quoting its sources in China, stated that earlier this year, Beijing directed some of China's largest telecom companies to phase out foreign chips or foreign processors in their networks by 2027. So the 2027 deadline coincides with Professor Yuan's assessment of Xi Jinping's timeline uh, for war. And then the same, uh, the same, it, that order came from the, I think the Minister of uh, Information and Industrial Technology. It's M-I-I-T, yeah, M-I-I-T Ministry, the Ministry of Information and Industrial Technology. So the same ministry has also called for Chinese automakers to accelerate the adoption of Chinese-made chips. And the ministry's technical regulatory department had previously required Chinese automakers to source one-fifth or 20% of their chips domestically by 2025. But they are unhappy with the progress being made so far. So to summarize, so what does all of this mean? Well, Xi Jinping has many opponents right now. The Jiang faction, the Deng faction, the Hu Jintao faction, the princelings, even officials in his own faction are opposing him in, in secret. Earlier in March, we heard that after the two ministers, uh, the, the, the foreign minister and the defense minister, after they were arrested, they confessed that there was a group of people within CCP's diplomatic and military systems who are not loyal to Xi Jinping. Um, and then the commander of the strategic support force, uh, Zhu Ganshen, and the former political commissar of the rocket force, Xu Zhongbo, made similar detailed confessions. They claimed that many officials and generals had formed a political clique with Jiang Zemin's son, Jiang Mianhen, and engaged, I have a picture of, of, of the guy, here's the guy, and engaged in illegal political activities. And most, and, and interestingly, most of these individuals are people Xi Jinping ha, has promoted himself. So it's like people in Xi Jinping's own faction is secretly, um, against him. So this has caused him considerable anxiety and frustration. So to address the political crisis, um, like all CCP leaders before him uh, did, you know, they rely on polit internal political struggles uh, to get ahead. So it's very likely that she will start a political campaign to attack Jiang Zemin. This will divide his opposition forces, right? It's the divide and conquer strategy. Meanwhile, rebuilding the economy isn't his priority, but preparing for war is. This is because, like the official, like what the official said, he sees great opportunities in a tumultuous world. Um, the current geopolitical situation presents both great threats and great opportunities. So I don't think Xi Jinping will sit tight and do nothing. He will definitely want to take advantage of the opportunities. His heavy sentencing of General Liu is, you know, Liu Yajo is the evidence that he is serious, dead serious about war. If he wasn't serious about war, why would he care so much about what a retired general say about, you know, war strategy, right? Um, so that's what I have gathered for you. Um, let me do some question and answers, but I have two questions that I want to answer because I think this could be a very typical question. What do I think of the prospect of war in the Taiwan Strait? I was asked this question two, two days ago. At the time, I said, it's hard to tell. It's 50-50. Um, but I think in the matter of two days, the chances of having a war has increased. It has outweighed uh, the chances of no war. So two days ago, I said 50-50. Now I think it's 
um, I don't know if it's 55, 45, but definitely, you know, it's not balanced. It has tipped. It has tipped to one, one side. Um, this is because the intensifying and proliferation of wars and regional conflicts that we see around the world in Ukraine, in Middle East, South China Sea, the Red Sea, um, provide the CCP the most ideal opportunity to attack Taiwan because the United States and its allies are tied up, right, in, in, in trying to solve, trying to solve regional conflicts. Um, and then if you if you really look at the chances of war when the CCP leader is confident, uh, the risk of war is high. And when he's not and is in crisis mode, uh, the risk of war is, is even higher, actually, right? Um, so that's why I'm quite pessimistic about the prospect of war. Um, another question that I'm that, that I'm often asked is, does the do the princelings want to overthrow Xi Jinping? Um, and then if they do, uh, will Chinese will the Chinese people have a better government? Um, now, my answer is. Do the princelings, princelings want to overthrow Xi Jinping? And, um, and, and will, will the Chinese people have a better leader? My answer to both questions is no. This is because the princelings are the privileged class. Uh, even though they don't see eye to eye with Xi Jinping, they share similar qualities with him. Their experiences during the Cultural Revolution have defined uh, their political views or the, the political views of a lot of them. Um, and one common trait that they have or one common thing, one thing that they have in common is that they all want to protect the regime and extend the longevity of the CCP's rule because that's where their privilege um, has come from. So from this perspective, they're not very different from each other. Um, it's within that, it's, it's basically under the CCP's umbrella of family, right? Th they're just fighting, fighting with each other over, okay, this is my way versus your way. Um, and, and so I don't think, I don't think they are that fundamentally different. However, there's a small percentage of princelings who support real political reforms, like the sons of uh, former, former Secretary General Hu Yaobang, uh, like Hu Deping, right? He has, he has two brothers. Um, now, they are the minority, and, but even these, um, these princelings are adamant about um, political reforms they are not going to upset. Uh, I think they, uh, Xi Jinping used to be very close with the Hu brothers. Uh, remember the uh, Yuan Hongbin, the professor that I introduced at the beginning of, of this program used to be a drinking buddy with Xi Jinping. Remember, the, um, they used to drink a bottle of Mao Tai together. And the person who, who introduced them was Hu Deping, uh, Hu Yaobang's uh, son. So, and and the and Hu Yaobang, the, the the their fathers were very close with each other. So the two families are very close, and it was it was even said that during that one week when Xi Jinping was missing, remember when he was the uh, crown prince, he missed from he disappeared for a week, well actually more than a week, he disappeared for a period of time, and it was said that he was with, uh, you know, one of the Hu brothers, so. They're very close. So as much as the Hu brothers want to push for political reforms, they are not going to turn against Xi Jinping because uh, they were friends. They were very close friends before. And even though they have completely different political views and they disagree with each other, um, from what I heard, the, 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 the Hu brothers are not likely to turn against Xi Jinping. So with that said, 
Um, I think we should not put our hope on another princeling or another leader from uh, from 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 within the system. I think unless that person you know is adamant about going through pushing for real political reforms, then they're all the same. If they do not want to have uh, genuine political reforms, even if they go back to the Deng Xiaoping's time, it's you know it's the same. Um, so I think I just answered two most common questions that I get. Let me see if people have other questions for me. All right, let's see. All right, not, not a whole lot. Okay, good. If you have questions for me, put my name in the front. All right. Uh, okay, no question. Nick Fury, is the PLA excited and itching to go to war? I don't think so. I, I think from everything that I've heard, um, they, they, they don't want to. They know that they're not prepared. You know, um, actually, I wanted to make a program about... Um, Someone has written a series of articles. Um, he has studied like the PLA's media. You know, the PLA has its own newspaper and they often write about their military training. They interview their star soldiers and star officers and they tell their stories, you know, try to we try to boost morale by telling these inspirational stories. And somebody has gone in and, and studied these stories, these media reports, and find all the problems with that exist fr from a military expert's point of view, all the problems within the PLA. And um, I'm not a military expert, but now when I read that series of articles, I thought it was so it was so eye-opening because. <laughs> Um, so maybe I'll, I'll I'll see how I can present that. Um, it, it was it was it was even funny when you read it. Yeah. Um, so they know they've been fooling their superior all this time with these military drills and exercises. I don't think they're excited to go to war because they are not prepared at all. Okay. All right. Let's see. All right, no questions for me. Okay, I must have done so well this Saturday night. Am I? Have I? Okay. All right. Okay, no questions. Uh, Ray T. Ayu. Am I pronouncing it right? We love you late. Thank God for your talents. Okay, if I have any. I don't think I have any talents. <laughs> Seriously, that's how I feel. But it doesn't matter. With, I think I think this society has put so much emphasis on talents. Sometimes I think, does, does it really matter you need to have talent? Um, because we always emphasize the skills, our, our um, you know, our, 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 I mean, I appreciate your, um, I, I'm not trying to put down, put you down, but I'm just saying, I think sometimes the heart matters more. Like when you really have the heart to do something, then you will have the talent. It's it's not the other way around. It's not like, okay, I ha I'm really good at something and therefore I'm going to do it and I'll be very successful. I think it's the other way around. You really, really want to do something and then you'll be good at it. So <laughs> anyways, that's one of Lay's crazy theories. <laughs> All right. Let's see. No questions for me. Okay, good. Oh, here's one. My Chinese home kitchen. Uh, great analysis. Let's pray to God you are wrong, but I fear you are spot on. About what part? Um, oh, about the war? Uh, yeah, I let's pray to God that I was wrong. Yeah, okay. 
Mitsu, what do you think of the Columbrium houses? What's the Columbrium Brium houses? Uh, okay, all right. <laughs> oh my goodness, there's a war out there. Uh, all right. Ian Slater, first time listener. Question, how does how does uh, internal conflict currently with CCP affect BRICS development? Uh, that's a, that's uh, I need to think about that question. Internal politics affect BRICS development. I mean, one is internal politics. One is international relations. You're asking how does their internal political struggle, struggles affect CCP's foreign policies? I have not thought about it. But um, if you have ideas that you want to exchange with me, you can feel free to email me. But that, I have not really thought that far. Um, inter internal politics and foreign affairs. Well, that's that's something we should definitely, you know, give it some thoughts. Good question. Very good questions. Um, Jay Leitka, who are Taiwan's main allies, ones that would support them in case of war? Well, U.S. and Japan. The Japanese Prime Minister is in uh, is is visiting the U visiting the U.S. and gave a speech, right? Addressed the Congress, and I think the Beijing is is mad. Um, there's a, a social media account affiliated with the state media that's you know extremely mad um, at um, at the Japanese Prime Minister over his speech. I think the speech was very. Um, very important because I think Japan has, you know, I think Japan is 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 ready to play a much bigger role in geopolitics. It's almost like it's, um, yeah, it's a dec you know Japan's declaration of of, of something, but uh, but CCP is is mad judging by the by the reaction by the reaction from that from that um from that media account it's the official social media account of an official media so Etsy, wouldn't it be better for China if she had democratic reforms and more opening up of society? It will help the economy and increase the chances of a peaceful union with Taiwan. That's what we think. No, but that's not in the mind of a communist leader. Because if he continued to open up, the country would be left. It, it doesn't work for him because the country will be left uh, as an empty shell because all the officials and private citizens will move their children and their assets overseas because people people don't have confidence in their in their country right so he will have to do so many things including real political reforms to to re, to regain the confidence of his people and when that happens the ccp regime is, is will be history and then china will not will no longer be a common state it will be democratic after so many runs of political reforms. So he, he's stuck. You know, he cannot continue the economic, the path of the economic reforms because, you know, he will lose control. It will no longer be a communist state. Um, so he can go, at, is that, that's why he accuses Jiang Zemin and Deng Xiaoping of breaking a great communist state that Mao put together. Because of the, he accuses them, you know, the economic reforms basically, you know, has has bro broken, right? It, it has broken the backbone of of the communist state. On the other hand, he can't really return to the Maoist era because people have been exposed to these, you know, Western liberal ideas and and you know democracies and people have traveled the world they've seen other places they've had money they've had 
you know, real estate and all of a sudden you want to take those away from them, people are not going to be willing. So, um, so he's really stuck. He's stuck. He can't turn left. He can't turn right. Um, the only solution for him is to get rid of the communist rule, you know, reform China to become a democratic nation. That's his only way out. But anyways, um, Um, let's see, M Mitsu, how dangerous do you think she is to the princelings now? Is he like King Jong-un now? I don't think he's very dangerous. You know, you have to understand the princelings are, are a very unique group. Like I said, I, I answered that question. They, they don't see eye to eye, but they may not fight each other, you know, to death because they they have a common goal. Their common goal is to protect this regime, protect their forefathers' um, accomplishment, because that's that's where that that safeguards their uh, prestige and privilege. So they have a common goal. So even though they fight with each other, they, you know, I don't think they're gonna, you know, kill each other. <laughs> And Liu Yazhou is different because he is not a born princeling. He married into uh, a red family. So he's the son-in-law. He's not the son. Um, and, and so Xi Jinping picked him. And he's very outspoken. So Xi Jinping picked him um, as, as a stick warning uh, to warn to warn the other princelings. Okay. All right. Um, my Chinese home kitchen will be very asymmetrical. We've seen how they can hack U.S. electrical war grid and, and water grids. That illegal bio lab near Navy's F-18 base in California and 20,000 PLA have crossed <laughs> Joe Biden's border. Um, yeah, it's, you know, that's a valid concern. It's a valid concern. It's going to be an unequal war. War. It will be, what do you call that? Um, unrestricted warfare, right? Okay. Um, I think I'm at the end. Oh, so, did you see the eclipse? I didn't see. I from where I am, I um, I didn't see anything. I was driving on Monday. I was trying to look up to see if the sky will get dark, but nothing. Um, I didn't see it. But from where where I am, I should be able to see it. So I don't know what happened. Um, All right, that's that seems to be all. Oh, here's one question. I have my name. Somebody said Chris, Chris, Christian Sigardson. What happened to China that I know? That's a big question. Watch all my videos and you will find out. What happened to the China I, I know? Um, okay, all right, question. Brandon G. Does Taiwan Pan Green Coalition support one China, two systems? Pan Green Coalition support one China, two systems. I think, I think, equal, no, I don't think, no, I don't think so. I think their, their uh, position is that Taiwan doesn't need to declare independence. It's already an independent country. It has its own currency. It has its own military. It has its own flag. I mean, everything it has, it's it's an independent country by all definition. So it doesn't need to declare independence at all. So this one China, two systems don't apply to them. Uh, Grandma Jim, how is she's relationship with J King Jong-il? 
You mean Kim Jong Un? I heard they didn't like each other. Yeah, I I don't think they like each other. I think communist leaders, none of them like each other. You think Mao Mao didn't like Stalin, Mao didn't like Khrushchev, right? And so the communist leaders they 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 hang out together because they're in the same camp, but they don't like each other. I don't think Putin and Xi Jinping like each other. I don't think Putin like Xi Jinping, although Xi Jinping may like Putin. So, <laughs> um, uh. I don't know. <laughs> How do I know? <laughs> uh, Le, it seems to be heating up on those islands off the Philippines. Do you think there could be a serious conflict there, or is China just being the bully act? Well, the the South China Seas of the Philippines serves as a testing ground for the CCP. The CCP needs to have a a place uh, where it can test the United States. So the South China Sea, the Philippines has served that purpose because uh, Beijing understands it cannot test Taiwan in the Taiwan Strait because a war can erupt, right? Uh, when they, so, it, 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 so it, it, cannot, it does not want to risk anything by testing uh, the United States and the Japanese and the Taiwanese um, anywhere near Taiwan. Uh, but it, it wants to provoke a people in the South China Sea because it can always um, pull back. So that's so the so the South China Sea almost serve as a, 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 a dress rehearsal stage for the CCP to test to test the United States and its allies. That's the role that it's playing. That's why they're very, they're very aggressive there. The worst is some a military conflict broke out and China pulled back to say, "Oops, sorry, uh, I didn't mean to," you know, and they pull back. But they can they cannot do that in the Taiwan Strait. So, but it needs a place like South the South China Sea to 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 do that kind of thing, you know. Um, Uh, 10 Planet Archive. Do you think we're close to World War III or when do you think World War III starts? Some people say it has already started. If you're looking, if you look at it, I mean, depends on your definition of war. If you're talking about, you know, we have to see missiles and rockets, you know, being launched at each other and that defines war, then we haven't. But if you go by the Chinese definition of unrestricted warfares, we are already at war. The trade war. The trade war is part of that, right? And then the cyber war, um, you know, the 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 intelligence, the espionage activities. That's also part of this war. So, so depending on your definition, so from that, from the new, from the new definition, it's it's already started. Lay, due to highly co high cost of grave service and fees, relatives of the dead prefer to rent an apartment place, you know, place the dead loved ones rather than place them in an traditional burials. Yes, that has been ongoing in China. Um, it, because um, unfortunately, the, the burial grounds or even the, uh, what do you call that? Columbarium? You know the 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 towers or structures that hold the ashes of the deceased. They're very expensive, so they're like selling real estate <laughs> for the dead. Um, so the Chinese has has a saying. You know we cannot afford to live because real estate is so expensive, and we cannot afford to die because the graveyards are so expensive. So the family members have have bought apartment buildings to um, to put the urns. Um, they don't put the, I mean, they, they put the urns, the ashes there. They, they built kind of a, a shrine, right, and put the ash there um, because it's so much cheaper than, <laughs> than uh, buying a, a space in the memorial home. Yeah, they've, they've done that. And then the local residents are, uh, are protesting because they don't want to be living with the dead. I mean, it's crazy. All right. 
All right, that seems to be all. Okay, I'll end it here. Um, any other questions? Alvin Chu, can China have more than one tiger on the mountain? No, no mountains can accommodate two tigers. That's a Chinese saying. If you have two tigers on the same mountain, you're going to have a war. Uh, that's also a saying for household. That's when, say, when they have a, when you have two tigers at home, you're going to have war. Um, that means when a couple are both very strong, <laughs> you're going to have um, a war at home. So that's, that's the Chinese saying. All right. Okay. I think, oh, here's one question. Godot, Godot, any news from Shanghai clique leaders like Li Changchun, Zhang Dejiang, and Han Zhen? Um, I think these people, I think Xi Jinping, if, if she wants to take down the Jiang faction, these people will be affected for sure. But Jiang is not going to focus on these people. He's going to warn these people, but he's going to focus on Jiang Zemin's sons. And, um, so, so you're right. So these people um, are are part of the Jan faction, but then depending on, you know, I mean, they they're retired, and Jan is dead. Depending on what they what their priorities are, maybe they have already, you know, given up their affiliation with the Jan faction and defected to Xi Jinping, and that's possible. All right. Oh, here I have a super chat question. Whoa, Jean, thank you. Well, thank you for the generosity. Questions? Questions for me? No? No questions? Um, Thomas Waldron, will she ever really get command of PLA? His appointments so far have been flawed. Um, I don't think so. I made a video last Saturday about Xi Jinping's troubles with the PLA leadership. I think I did a good job summarizing all the issues he has with the top leadership of the PLA. So, I mean, he can, he, he's not a, a general. I mean, even though he's the chief commander, you, he can direct his military in, in, in war or on battlefields. So he relies on his, his generals to fight fight the war so if he has no control of those people or, or if these people are not getting along i don't know how they're going to be effective uh, on the battlefield um okay do i have a question somewhere uh pablo skates what do you make of japan joining AUKUS. I think that's very important. I think Japan will play the role of Japan will play the role that, that the United Kingdom played during World War II, right? Being um, um, like, you know, during World War II, the United States and, and, the, and then the UK um, became very strong allies. Um, and in this and this time, if a war breaks out in the Pacific, it will be Japan and the US. So Japan will play a very important role um, if we do see a real war breaks out. All right. Um, okay, that seems to be all. I need to take a break, but but thank you. Oh, here, Brandon G. Thank you for the explanation. Was worried Pan Green was stepping into one China, two system. Nope. Um, uh, Lei, Z team, what, what, why you don't talk about Carl Lee? Who's Carl Lee? Uh, who's Carl Lee? A Chinese? <laughs> People bomb, somebody's asking, who's Carl Lee? I have no idea who that is. You mean Karl Marx? I don't know. Um, Peter, Taiwan is great and independent. My travel companion who holds a PRC passport was the only one 
on our group trip to Taiwan that had to apply for a visa prior to entering the country. Yeah, if you hold a PRC passport, you should get a visa, of course. I mean, think about it. Taiwan is such a small island. You have one billion Chinese. If a tiny small percentage of million Chinese go to Taiwan, they can flood the island. And how do you know who those people really are? So, yeah. All right. Well, I thank you, everyone, for joining me. I enjoy the questions. And thank you for the donation. Thank you, Jean, for your support. And um, I will see you next time. And, oh, I have some old friends here. Kurt is here. Hi. Hi, Kurt. Uh, Max Shredder. Is it true that under CCP regime, the lives of many Chinese is, is no different from lives of cockroaches? CCP treats them as mineral resources. They treat them worse than mineral resources. You at least need to protect your precious mineral resources. I think these they're not even getting the status of um, of a mineral uh, resources. All right, there are a lot of questions. I can hardly catch up with you guys. There's just so many. Judy Gilmore, do you think the Chinese people value their ancient culture less than the political culture of today? Well, that's a very good question. They have lost, they don't know what their ancient culture is because of the Cultural Revolution. They've been brainwashed and um, the, the, the history book that we study has been altered and changed. So we may not even know the correct history of, um, so how, how can we be, how can we value our ancient culture, right? It has been destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. Okay. Michael A. Mayo, do you see the wheat contract cancellation as the start of a trade war involving soil and other goods as well? Yes. Yeah. I, 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 I see it that way. Carly was in Kung Fu movies. Okay, sorry. I don't watch Kung Fu movies. Sorry that I disappoint you. All right. Thank you very much. I think I'll end it here. <laughs> thank you for the, for the abundance of questions and comments. All right. Bye. Thank you. Have a week. Have a good, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye-bye.